Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman, and happy to welcome back first podcast episode of 2024 with David Anderson back to talk about some big picture takeaways from the bowl win over Miami. Uh, huge for Rutgers, of course, and a lot of the roster coming back for 2024. So wanted to focus on that as well as touch on the addition of Ethan Kalik Manis, uh, the transfer quarterback from Minnesota. David, first, uh, Happy New Year, and wanted to start with you in terms of kind of some of your big picture takeaways on Rutgers from that victory over Miami and how it kind of pushes things forward for this uh, 2024 season ahead now. Happy New Year to you. Thanks for having me. And I think that this was an interesting game because, well, first of all, we had some commenters who said, well, you guys are saying you can't predict what's going to happen, but you're giving predictions. Like, well, we got to do something. (laughs) <laughs> and then a funny thing was, I feel like every prediction we had pretty much came true and more. And I feel like that in terms of how the game would play out, not like who would win by how many or anything like that. I just mean like yeah, Miami is going to try to get Rutgers moving laterally. Rutgers was going to try to confuse their defense, like all those sorts of things. And they all kind of happened and more. And I feel like there was multiple games during the season that that happened. But I guess the biggest takeaway just to start with is, one thing that makes football unique with these bowl games is that not everybody ends their season with a loss. With the bowl game, you have an opportunity to end with a win. Rutgers had not ended with a win, even without the fact that they were going to bowl games. Like they didn't even squeak a win out, you know, in that finale against Michigan State in 2018, I think it was, or anything like that. Um, but this is the first time they ended the season with a win since 2014, which is kind of nice. So there is definitely a, a wave of momentum there. I think that. Everything was on display that Rutgers has a coaching to close a slight talent gap because even though Miami was playing number twos and number threes at some positions, they still, Rutgers was still able to overcome it. Uh, but I think that, and we'll get more to this later in the episode, but pretty much the way Ja'Curry Brown played is what we kind of wished Gavin Wimsett would play. And now it's his first game of the season. So you could see the difference between, like, for example, Brown through that. I I don't know if it was first and 25, but it definitely came after a 15 yard penalty when he just threw that post corner out to Restrepo and it seemed like an easy touchdown. And so I think, I guess one of my other big takeaways is we're going to see more of that when we have teams like Washington and Oregon on the schedule. Rutgers knows that. And a lot of this off season is going to come down to like, it always does self scouting. Like what, even when you have wins and you have victories, how do you improve the team? And so I think that was my biggest takeaway. Like you saw flashes of what burned Rutgers earlier in the season, what could burn them in the future. But then you also saw Rutgers do enough to overcome that in this game. But can they do more to kind of close some of those gaps? That's kind of my biggest takeaway coming away from the, from the game. So feel positive, but you know what areas you need to improve the team. Yeah, I think it's a great point about the defense. I think, you know, everyone kind of – I've seen a lot of hopes that, oh, the, with the defense that they have returning – you know, they're going to be a top 10 defense. And and I agree with you in terms of the Pac-12 teams coming in. Like, part of why Rutgers was statistically good against the pass this year is they really didn't face a lot of good passing offenses. Right. And uh, I think next season's schedule, uh, you know, even like with Wisconsin, you know, getting Van Dyke from Miami, uh, it, they're going to face better quarterbacks, I think, across the board next season than they did this past season. For sure. Um, and then I guess the best kind of data point is, There was a a crazy stat. They were showing that the number of teams that have been shit out in the last 10 or 20 years from the Power Five. And Iowa finished 10 and four, but they have been shut out three times this season. They got shut out by Penn State in the Big Ten title game and in their bowl game. And so we had that previous episode talking about how Rutgers stacks up against Iowa and Penn State. And so I guess one of my biggest takeaways is yeah, I think that the strategy worked now. But if Iowa's defense couldn't stop an SEC team who could throw the ball some and Rutgers defense isn't as good as Iowa, even if Rutgers improves some, even if they're at that point, they may be in trouble against a team that can really air it out. And we talk about how this upcoming schedules without having to face the big three in the East every year, there's less quote guaranteed losses on the schedule. But at the same time, a game could become a guaranteed loss in the first quarter if you realize you cannot stop their passing game at all. And that kind of leads into my biggest, you know, concern for the defense going into next year. 
And I mentioned this once on an earlier podcast, which is Rutgers defense is good and pretty much everybody is pretty fast, but they only had three, maybe four guys who had above average speed for their position. And you're losing two of them for sure. Max Melton and Deion Jennings for their positions. They were definitely above average with speed. Then you have Mo Ture, who you can see how effective he is when you're able to use that speed in a variety of ways. And then the only other one who I'd say might be above average for speed for his position is Wesley Bailey, who is banged up. So that's kind of a wild card. So my biggest overall concern for this defense is do they have enough team speed overall to take yeah. the next step? Or are they going to be handcuffed by that on the defensive side and have to just kind of make do while they continue to add speed? Like with this freshman class, they might be a year away from contributing, but it's possible that they might be desperate and have to play Kaj Sanders in a safety rotation or something like that. You know, unless maybe Moses Walker plays even better than he played in the bowl game, stuff like that. So I think there's reasons for optimism, but that would be my biggest reason for concern heading into or why they might not be able to jump as a defense to the next step. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I think on the flip side on offense, you know, we saw the physicality of Rutgers and their their ability to wear down the speed of Miami on that end. Uh, with the run game, uh, obviously Manungai was uh, out of his mind in that game uh, in terms of, I mean, pretty consistent with what he's done so many times this year, but he really, uh, you know, dominated that game in the fourth quarter. But you're right, speed, I think speed across the board. Obviously, Rutgers needs, you know, at the wide receiver position, they need to get faster, uh, but also on the a defensive end as well. And you're talking about, like, you know, I keep hearing, though, Washington's not going to be as good because Penix is going to be gone. But they got Will Rogers, who's the, the second most passing yards in SEC history, right. replacing him. Uh, it's Yeah, it's going to be a whole set of different challenges. I think the dynamic of uh, the Big Ten is changing because you're adding those offenses. And then you also have, you know, you have Kirk Signetti at Indiana now. You know, you have uh, Smith at uh, Michigan State, like, all, I, offense is going to be a lot better, I think, moving forward in the Big Ten. Um, and I know Rutgers doesn't play Indiana next year. They did play Michigan State. Um, but, you know, it's going to, like, Wisconsin's looking to be more up-tempo, uh, you know, uh, with their offensive coordinator so uh, long ago. So I, I think, yeah, it's how does the Rutgers defense adjust to that? Uh, and, and we've seen in the past with Shiana's defenses are at its best. They're flying around all over the field. And we did see some of that this year, but I think, yeah, it's it's uh, the Big Ten as as a whole is is improving. I think offensively, so that's going to be a challenge for all the defenses. And I think Rutgers, how they adapt to that, you know, in terms of getting speed on both both sides of the ball, is going to be key. Yeah, I mean, I think on offense, the Rutgers offense, I guess, flipping over to that, you touched on it, is it's actually better probably that more Big Ten teams are going to be going away from this style of football. Because then if you stick with it, then it's going to be more of an advantage, right? Like they say, if everybody's zigging and you can zag. So there's definitely room there where if, you know, let's say uh, Minnesota or Illinois, right? If they're not playing Smash Mouth Wisconsin and they're only playing Smash Mouth Iowa and Smash Mouth Rutgers, that's only two teams maybe on their schedule that play that kind of football. And, we, and I said it in the pregame, like – Miami, you can wear them out. And Rutgers did wear them out eventually. And so the question was, if Rutgers was not playing with the lead, would they have been able to do what they did in the in the fourth quarter? Because I don't believe Wimsat threw a pass in the fourth quarter. And the answer is probably not. So you can keep this style, but there's definitely a need to augment it with at least a little bit more of an effective passing game, regardless of how you do that. It's just, it's got to be more of a threat, but I, I do agree that um, the big 10 is changing, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to change what works for you on offense. Uh, as long as you can improve, you know, the other aspects to make the team not one dimensional. True. I agree with that. I, I think one thing I, I came away with after the game that I, I, I said, and I think my rapid reaction was that also though, like, I think we, we, we see the pot – like, that game was very, I think, uh, indicative of where the team is at, where the program's at, just in terms of, like, a ceiling right now. Because I think 
you know, we saw this season teams they kind of matched up relatively evenly with or were favored against. You know, they won all those games, and yet Miami is probably the one team that was uh, more talented, without question, uh, that they won. But like that style, also like if they they're not a team that's going to be able to come back against high powered offenses. So I think right. there is a, a very clearly defined season uh, ceiling. Excuse me. Uh, obviously, the Ohio State game they gave them everything they had, um, but you know, overall moving forward, like, like Rutgers isn't, you know, there's going to be, even though they don't have those built-in losses with Michigan, Ohio state, whatever, they're going to be really challenged to compete with certain teams in the conference with the style of offense they have. Um, they, the key is, can you win all those other games that you match up relatively evenly? in? and we know year after year, that's, that's really hard to do. Um, but as you said, if they can continue to get better in that style, then that, that's obviously huge. I, I do think, though, that, you know, obviously receiver, and, and you have to imagine, I would think in the portal, that they got to go and get a, a somewhat of an established tight end. Uh, you know, I know they have some young guys coming in, um, but, you know, they have to get some kind of production. I mean, Langan had his moments, but I think overall you need a, a, a tight end in the passing game uh, to be a little bit more of a focal point, I think, moving forward. Sure. I mean, do you, it's a really interesting launching point. I mean, do you want to talk about the future quarterback battle and that yeah, context? Let's go for it. Sure. Sure. So uh, first off, credit to Mike and Richie uh, because they had the cut up and a lot of analysis just on the differences between Gavin and Ethan Kelly McManus, you know, over the course of the past season. And one of the things that they did yesterday was they did a live stream of every Ethan Kelly McManus pass attempt of the year, which was kind of incredible. I'm sure it took a lot of work to do that. And I think the biggest takeaway that I had there, there's many, and we can talk about many, Yeah. but one of the biggest differences between, and again, let, let me first clarify this before we get comments. As soon as I say this, there's probably an 80, 85% overlap between what Gavin Wimstad brings to a team and what Ethan Kelly McManus brings to a team. It's a majority of what they do is very similar. So everything we're about to talk about is pretty much on the margins. It's like maybe 10 to 15% of what one versus the other one is going to do. And I know Rutgers has a Johnny Shepard and AJ Serace, and that it's even more complicated than what I'm about to say. But in the, in the situation where Ethan Kelly McManus is your starting quarterback next season, what it, one of the big observations from this past if, year. If, 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 if. Right. I'm saying in the, in the world where he is, yeah. then he had a lot more success throwing to his main receivers. He had really good chemistry with Jackson and yeah. Spanford. Yeah. So one of them's obviously a receiver, one of them's a tight end. So in if he's playing quarterback, then I think you can see he he has more confidence throwing to his tight ends, especially if he has a tight end that he trusts. In the case of Gavin, I think to your point, Langan was effective at times. I think he was more effective last year than this past season. I mean, the game against yeah. Michigan State last year when Rutgers actually made somewhat of a comeback, one of the few times they did, to your point. But I think they really are going to need like a Bowman-sized guy with a, with the a Langan skill set and some improvement from Winsat for him to be able to feel confident throwing to his tight end. So the question is, can you get someone like that in the portal? Or maybe you have a guy who's a sufficient enough blocker, but is more of a receiving threat at tight end because none of the ones that they had this year were really more of a, like we hope maybe Mike Higgins will step into that role and maybe he can next year. But I think that for regardless of who's playing quarterback, you need to make up for the fact that your number one and two tight ends are out of eligibility. So, yeah, I mean, I would say in terms of needs on offense, now that they have Demir Miller at receiver, tight end is one where, if you can only get an average guy, I'm not sure how much that moves the needle. But if you can get someone who can be a plus receiver or a plus blocker that you can pencil in in one of the first two roles of tight end, then, yeah, I absolutely think that there's an argument to be made that that's the biggest need remaining on offense. Yeah, I just think even if it's an average guy, I mean, like they have very little experience at that position. So I think, um, you know, even having someone, even if it's not necessarily a huge upgrade in terms of talent wise, uh, just someone that's, you know, played a significant amount of football that can be somewhat of a, 
you know, competent blocker and pass catcher. If they're just average, I think not. You're going into the year with so much inexperience there. I think is a little concerning. But um, yeah, no. I, I and in terms of Calic Manis, you know, there was a lot said about you know his his completion percentage was at 53 percent last year, I believe. Wims is obviously at 48. You know, the adjusted completion percentage. I got all these comments. Oh, you have to redo your video. You have to. <laughs> you have to put this in there. Yes, he had a 66 percent. Adjusted completion percentage. Uh, there was, I believe Minnesota had 25 drops, but that adjusted completion percentage is still the bottom half of college football. Not not to say that I think Calic Manis, I, I think he can be good here, but also the idea that like he had no like Jackson is was the best receiver, would have been the best receiver on Rutgers last year, no like by a clear margin. Yeah. And Spam Ford would, would have been a huge upgrade at tight end. So I, I think it's a little overblown that you know he uh was in this terrible situation. Uh, again, I do think he has some upside. Uh, and I want to get into it a little bit too in terms of just his mechanics and stuff. But um, I, I don't think it, w- it was as uh, so much more challenged than necessarily what Wimsett was dealing with in terms of, you know, the lack of experience at wide receiver, tight end, offensive line, all that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, and I'm going to probably say this multiple times so we're not misquoted. I mean, w- there's a lot of overlap, both in terms of their situation as well as what they bring to the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of Kelly Manis, I guess I'll go to the upside thing. I think he was better last year under Kirk Sharadka than he was this past season. And yep. one of them was the mechanical thing that you can talk about that I saw as well. But when you talk about like his actual situation is – there were more times watching that Minnesota film that guys were dropping passes and I was looking at my screen like, come on. Like, in in Gavin's case, I think there were drops. And statistically, I don't know how many off the top of my head. But there were a couple of passes that you're like, guys got to catch this ball. You know, Bowman had at least two, especially one was a drive killer against Michigan State. Um, they ended up winning, luckily. But I don't – I don't – think that the situations like you said were that much different with the receivers i would say there were a couple more drops in minnesota for sure but there were still plenty of balls that just kind of came out of his hand and just didn't seem right and yeah. gavin has that sometimes as well I, I don't know if we have numbers like of exactly how many times that happened but when we talk about inaccuracy issues one of them is like well how many passes just literally just were just came out of your hand so poorly they were uncatchable and we used to see that with no with Noah Vedral sometimes. Um, but in terms of his mechanics, like what I saw, and I think you had a slightly different take on it. What I saw was that, I, I, like, when he's at his best, he actually throws like Mike McMahon, like r- former Rutgers great Mike McMahon. But when he's not, he's doing a little bit of like double tapping on the ball, which can also kind of let you believe that he's about to throw. And then also – it seemed like his ball was coming from a lower angle, which was one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I think he was having more passes batted down at the line because Gavin had that sometimes too, but not as often. I mean, he definitely had some passes batted down, but one of the things that just kills you as an offense is if a guy's open, you see him, the play's perfect, but the pass gets knocked down by a defensive lineman. But otherwise, mechanically, it did seem like his mechanics were different than from the year prior. That's something you saw as well, was it not? Yeah, yeah. In terms of the arm angle, yeah, it, it seems like there were even times where he would go like three quarters or even sidearm at times, uh, based on you know the throw he was making. I do think he was more mobile than people. Like, I, I he threw off the run a lot more, I think, last year, and and yeah. I thought he was actually pretty good in doing so. Uh, and they they tend to do more uh, play action with him, and they uh, last year at least, and then also. Uh, there were a lot of design rollouts that he did. Like he, he, he looks like kind of just a traditional drop back, you know, three step passer, but he was a lot more mobile in the pocket than I think people realize. Um, but yeah, I, I noticed that in terms of the arm angles changing on different passes. And then also, uh, yeah, in terms of his, like he almost has like a wind up sometimes and it looked more, uh, I don't know if exaggerated is the right word, but based on like when he was uh, under Shiraka, it just seems like it became uh, um, more, more, more to it in, in a bad way in terms of, you know, taking longer to get the ball out of his hand. Uh, I don't know if that's just, you know, a, a kind of bad habits. I don't know if that's, you know, something in terms of Shiraka being back with him, he's able to eliminate that, but it did seem like 
you know, even with Wimsett, sometimes, even if his throws aren't the most accurate, like it comes out of his hand kind of naturally. Where right. Kyle McManus, you know, it does seem like he has to put like a lot of force in. There's a lot of force in his overall body motion. Um, it's not just so like, you know, uh, effortless. Yeah. Effortless and like centralized to just his arm, you know, like his mechanics are a little bit uh, jerky in terms of how his whole body goes into it. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things where, you know, I don't want to commit that I'm on team Gavin or team Ethan or team everybody or whatever. Yeah. But with Wimsett, he, he will continue to get better. And one of the reasons for that is because he does have that, that ability that just flick of the wrist. I mean, the best example of this ever is Michael Vick, where he's not a big guy, but he would just like, he didn't even have like a good like arm motion, but the ball could just like snap out of his wrist. Like, and it was impossible to, to react quickly as a defensive lineman. Like there's no way they're batting those passes down. And so I feel like Gavin has, when he has like his feet set, he has the ability to throw with more velocity and it's much easier to learn how to harness the velocity you have coming out of your arm than to try to get more. Like we saw from a Noah Vedral or in the NFL level, like, like a Chad Pennington, like you can do, you know, karate or whatever and improve some of the the muscles in here. But I mean, I don't think Calic Menace has a bad arm, but he's not the like Greek rifle or whatever that some people said of him, like when he was coming out of high school. So I do think that, um, he has to be in an optimized throwing motion mechanics to really improve on his game. Uh, if I look more also at last year, the the difference though is like I just feel like their coaching staff had more confidence in him to just hit those like first and ten five yard passes. Yep. And then the staff has with Gavin, like we saw it a few times, and I was actually pleasantly surprised in the bowl game when they ran that play with Gremel went in motion to the right, it was near the goal line, but mm-hmm. they kind of just threw him a quick dump off and he had some space because there was a, already a receiver on the line who was able to block. And then there was a little space before the safety was to come up. And that play worked really, really well. Rutgers very rarely saw that look this season because defenses did not respect them. But since Miami safeties were inexperienced, they were playing further off, which was a very smart tactical decision. But they didn't do that all year. And I felt like Kelly McManus had a couple passes like that. It's not even really a screen. It's more of just like a like a like a quick hitter almost to a receiver in motion, where if you yeah. have that look, whereas when Rutgers ran that to Dremel, yeah, it worked for that touchdown against Virginia Tech, but that was a longer developing play. Uh, they were lucky to have that touchdown against Virginia Tech, but then the same play basically got picked against Wisconsin. If you can right. kind of make the defense doubt like what the timing of the route is. Maybe he's going to throw it right away. Maybe he's going to throw it, you know, in a two-step drop. Maybe there's additional action off there. Like, that's going to open things up a lot. And we didn't see that. And I don't know if it's a coaching thing, if it's a lack of confidence in Gavin thing. But then all of a sudden they did it in the bowl game. So, but Kalik Manis has proven with a, with a larger body of work those type of plays that he can do. And so I think that he has shown more on tape in terms of more that he can do. And that being even when we're not just looking at highlights, because when you look at Gavin's highlights, nobody's highlights are as good as that (laughs) because he's got such a big arm and he's a powerful, fast runner. But I mean, if you look play in and play out, I felt like Kelly McManus was a little bit more reliable, even when you don't even look at the completion percentage or stuff like that, which he was slightly better on. But it definitely felt like there was just easy yards that Minnesota was able to get that Rutgers was not with Gavin behind center this year. Yeah, totally agree. I, I I think he definitely looks more reliable in that, you know, uh, 10, 10 yards or less uh, plays. Uh, he definitely, you know, it's funny, like when you watch all those games and I watched that tape that Richie made too, and I'm sure he was in like a dark room for like 36 hours <laughs> putting that together. Uh, it was an awesome job that he did. And, um, you know, there, there was, they started several games with like a running back, uh, you know, screen where a quick hitter where, he got open in space and would run it on the right sideline, like 20, 25 yards. And they started a, a few drives last season with that play. And um, yeah, he, he, he looks like he hits his, re- he's, he's definitely better in terms of hitting his receivers in stride uh, right. in shorter patterns, which is definitely something that, you know, Gavin struggled with. So uh, I think 
the ceiling overall in terms of if you want to talk about like long-term potential, I think Wimsett has a higher ceiling, but I think Kalik Manis raises the floor. And I think he potentially, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how they develop this off season. Um, and I think, you know, what can he kind of maybe fine tune under Shiraka a second time now, but you know, it's, it's, it's going to be consistency, right? Because I think Kalik Manis yeah. probably based on his film and, and what he did last year, he looks like he has the potential, I think, to, to give you more consistency than Wims has showed this year. Yeah. Yes, though we did see long stretches of Calic Manish, just like Gavin, where something gets out of sorts. Usually it's mm-hmm. a play or two happens where he doesn't know what's going on, right? He doesn't read yeah. the coverage right, and he throws into like – and whether it's intercepted or not, but like he throws it to a guy who's got two or three defenders on him, and you're like, yeah. what was that? There's some um, question marks then- Right. And then there's a snowball effect, like the game against Illinois, where Calic Manis was starting out great. And then it all fell apart. And then it kind of like seemed like he was riding the ship. And then he had to complete a pass. It was a third and four. If he basically hits that pass, the game's pretty much over. But he sailed it like way over the tight end's head. And so even though I do think he was a little bit more consistent on those intermediate routes, there's an example where he literally lost the game for them in a sense by missing a guy who was open. And so it's, I think my bigger takeaway is, yes, I do feel more confident him hitting, like if it's first and 10, throwing for six yards. But what's hard to say is that with the Rutgers run game, will defenses still just cram the the line of scrimmage? Because one of the reasons that I think Calic Manis had more um, success with those routes is defenses – really were scared of him throwing deep to Daniel Jackson, especially. Yeah. And really Rutgers hit one long play to Jaquay Jackson earlier in the year. I think it was against Temple. Temple. Yeah. But other than that, like how many fly routes or deep posts did they complete all season? Not many. So the question is, regardless of who's playing quarterback, will defenses still just say, okay, hey, we're just going to press the line of scrimmage and dare them to beat us deep? I don't know. Yeah. On film, it would indicate that defenses were more scared of Kelly McManus throwing downfield, but I don't know if that was because of Jackson or not. Their Jackson, not our Jackson. Though I do right. think if Jaquay Jackson was on Minnesota, he would have had a better season as well. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also because they didn't have a running back until, well, Darius Taylor, I think it's Darius Taylor, right? He yeah. he was injured at one point, and you can see that Kelly McManus started to drop off his performance when he did not have the threat of an elite run game as well. So I I don't know. It'll be really interesting to see. I mean, the biggest question I have that I I don't know the answer to, but we'll continue to, you know, probably if you have me on again in the off season is like, if you're a defense, are you going to play the same exact strategy, regardless of who's playing quarterback for Rutgers because you're of the threat of the run game or with wins that are you going to basically dare him to throw it deep? because you're scared of him running, so you're going to also stack the box because you don't want him to get in space. With Kelly McManus, he's a little quicker to kind of decide to, to run a little bit, but he's probably not going to burn you for a 70-yard touchdown. He's probably more likely to get a, a five-yard scramble, but you're not worried about an explosive play with him in the run game like you are with Wimsett. So I think that's what the coaching staff's going to have to evaluate because if defenses are going to not respect you, like we talked about, you know, with Noah Vedral, that the safeties are playing at like six or seven yards, whereas on film they're playing against nine or ten yards on everybody else, then what do you have to do to make them back off? Do you need to play a quarterback who's able to throw the ball or at least the threat of it downfield a little bit more? And, I mean, Calic Menace in his body of work definitely has completed more of those throws. But I don't know how much of that is design or how much of that is skills, and we'll have to hear what happens in spring practice as they try to determine that. But what do you think? I mean, do you think from what you saw, did it look like defenses were giving him more of those underneath routes, which is why he was completing more of them? Or was that just, I don't know, the the, the block of film that I saw compared to what you saw? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it was play design. I think they just – Minnesota made a point to, to you know, look for uh, the running backs out of the backfield and also tight ends. Um, and I think that he also – he, he just um, uh, looked a little, I think – more comfortable in, in, in those, uh, pass plays. Uh, but you know, as the season went on, you know, like you said, with when it had inconsistency in the run game, 
it did seem like Minnesota tended to not go as deep as much. And that kind of, I think created some, some issues. He, he, uh, he had a lot of like sideline patterns. They didn't really go up the middle very much. Uh, So it, you know, it was, uh, he was a lot of like, you know, long throws that weren't for many yards per se, but like, yeah. yeah, So I, 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 you know, it was, I, I honestly thought the play calling was kind of like, it wasn't great, you know? And, um, uh, so when I also think you touched on it, and it's a great point, is, you know, in 22, when he was under Shiraka, they, they had Mo Ibrahim as the running back. And that obviously was a huge thing. So um, he he obviously is going to be benefited by if he does end up playing, you know, uh, having a Manungai there. Um, and the other thing, too, that was interesting, if you watch the Wisconsin game from two years ago when he broke out that last regular season game, you know, early in the game, he, he, he tucked it and ran for like 20 yards and, and the announcer screaming, you know, that that's what he does best for Minnesota. So it's <laughs> funny because so many people are like, he's not a mobile quarterback, but I thought on the, the tape that Richie put together too, like you just saw, even if he's not running, he is a lot more active in the pocket, you know, which I think is important with the offensive line. He's not going to be a sitting, I, I think the initial impression was like, because he's, you know, he's broad shouldered, he's big. He's a little bit bigger than Gavin, 6'4". You know, he looks kind of like a traditional drop-back passer, but he really was much more active with his feet, um, you know, in terms of design rollouts, but also just being able to to avoid pressure. Uh, I, I thought he was better at that than I had thought going into it. Yeah, and honestly, especially when their run game was non-existent, he was under a ton of pressure. I, yeah. I think that Gavin was under less pressure for the most part, I mean, you can give an exception like Penn State. I think he was under a lot of pressure. But for yeah. the most part, in other games, other than maybe Michigan, when they finally, you know, at the late, we're like, all right, we got to pressure him. But for the most part, I mean, I felt like Calic Manis was under more consistent pressure than Gavin. I, I do think his pocket presence is better, uh, but also he – is very close to on that line of having happy feet because sometimes, like you said, he when there was pressure, he would look towards those deeps. They're not deep, but they're a long route through the sideline, and he really did not have success on those. Um, yeah. but it was kind of like, I know I got a receiver here, and his ball placement, like in terms of back shoulder and things like that, is a little bit better than Gavin's for sure. Um, there's definitely more plays where he could hit that. But um, in terms of just overall, if one guy run right, because really what you want from your quarterback is if one rusher comes through, can they step up or step to the side to give themselves a little more, more time? If two guys come in, there's very little that you can do usually. But if right. one guy breaks the, the seal of the, the pocket, like can you step to the side or, or make a play? And I felt like Calic Menace did do that. In terms of his like off-platform throws, he did make some – but there were other times where when he didn't have his feet set, especially if he tried those sideline routes, it didn't really work. But he seemed to have a good chemistry, especially with span forward. Like if a blitz were to come, like he he had a pretty good sense of like, okay, I can throw it to my tight end on like, he'll have outside leverage on this side and there won't be any help because there's a blitzing. They're blitzing, right? And he seemed right. to have a little bit of, of, of that in his game that I don't know if Gavin really showed us this year in terms of like ball placement where accurate it's accurate, but it's not like, you know, perfect accurate, but it's just throwing a ball into a spot and like that your receiver knows and can go get the ball. So, I mean, it, he showed more, but these are receivers he had the year prior. Whereas Gavin's throwing to Bowman, who wasn't on the roster, Jaquay, who wasn't on the roster. And so, you know, there was probably Chris Long was out who was one yep. of the guys he had better chemistry with the year prior, Gavin, I should say, in 2022. So I don't know. There's a lot of like weird variables, but you can kind of see flashes in every direction about this. But, yes, I do think that he's also a more um, – he's more quick to decide if he's going to run or not. And I think that decision-making also makes it tougher on the defense because I do think if it's third and four, I feel more confident in Kelly McManus picking up five yards with his legs – than I do with Gavin. Um, but I would say I have less confidence in like quarterback running that like, if you run it with him on first and 10, that he's going to get seven yards. There was plenty of times where Gavin did that. So again, right. I know we're, we're, we're kind of splitting hairs here because they're still very similar quarterback, but th- that is the pocket presence is a, is a huge thing. And I don't know if Rutgers offensive line is going to be able to pass protect as well as it did this year. 
or is that just a product of the run game? I don't know. But there's yeah. a lot of wild cards there. But definitely from a pocket presence standpoint, I mean, from ball placement, would you agree that there were more like back shoulder and timing throws from Halleck Manis? I feel like with Gavin, most of those were like slant routes where he was he had good timing on those. But most yeah. of the routes he threw for Gavin are just like slants or they're that quick curl on the, on the outside to Isaiah Washington. There's very few other like throwing it to a guy in stride or right. like other placement that was not just kind of a three-step throw at this moment. I mean, what did you think on that? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think Kyle McManus, you know, he um, definitely, uh, I, he, he, he looked like he had more confidence. I also think he reads coverages a little bit better. He seemed to, you know, make different reads. He wasn't just going to like his, his number one read all the time. He seemed like he was able to, like you said, his decision-making uh, was better. Uh, and he, you know, he did, he did make some risky throws, but, but again, I think it kind of went back to a, kind of a good confidence where he does seem like he believes he can make any throw out there and right. you don't have that with Gavin and uh, hopefully he can get that. But I think that that was something uh, that, that I noticed. And I think that just in terms of his awareness of, of what, you know, is he, even like when he didn't run, like he didn't stand still in the pocket. Like as soon as he sensed something, he was adjusting. This is me a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, Wimsett obviously is the more mobile quarterback. He's quicker, but uh, Kalik Manis seemed more comfortable throwing on the run than Wimsett has. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure if that, uh, like, that's something that pretty much everyone improves on. It's kind of like being a sh good shooter in basketball. Like, there's every guy is a better shooter when they're 40 years old than when they're 20. And I feel like Gavin, that is an area where I think he could improve because if he, was able to add that element to his game where even if it's not a designed rollout, but he gets to the outside, we would see more plays like we saw in week one against Northwestern where he hit Christian Dremel on that huge fourth down conversion. Because yep. when you're a defense, and I, I talked about this a lot, especially when Rutgers, I, I think it was like the, the 52 nothing game, which ultimately got Chris Ash fired in that game. Shea Patterson was just killing Rutgers in the pocket. Traditionally, he wasn't doing much. But he was rolling out and either running for, I think he ran for three touchdowns that day. But it was more he would roll to the side and then a receiver would like break off their route or come back towards him. And it's impossible for the defensive back to adjust to a moving, a mobile quarterback in that sense. And you saw when Gavin did do that, there were times he had success. There were other times he just threw it into the stands. And I don't know if that was a coaching thing or if he'll improve, but there's one of those things where you can see a reason that Gavin could could do that but he has not done it yet consistently but that's an area where he has the physical makeup to be able to do it um the other thing that we saw from gavin on those plays is sometimes he'll just throw a you know the fastball when he doesn't need to do it because the receiver does have a little bit of room that's another thing that you know will improve over time as yeah. well so i think it's going to be an interesting an interesting battle but ultimately it's going to come down to who's going to be more consistent with their throws, putting them in identical situations and seeing who's performing well. Cause right now we're not putting them in, in identical situations, but in training camp, you can, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then secondly is just what, how do defenses react? I, I do think that there's a, like you see this in basketball a lot where a defense will assume the best play to play you is like, let's say a two, three zone, which is different in terms of, you know, how you have to play it as an offense and, and quarterback is quite similar. Like if they're going to play more like deep thirds, like cover three against you, then even if one guy is a little bit overall as a better quarterback, but defenses are consistently going to show you a coverage that the other quarterback is better at handling. Sometimes you have to just, and that's one of the reasons why I think you should make in-game adjustments. You go to your backup quarterback is a situation like that. You know, even if let's say Gavin's the overall better quarterback, but defenses are going to constantly just like pack the line of scrimmage. And when Cali Manish comes in the game, they don't like maybe maybe that's a, a reason that the coaching staff has to make an adjustment. I don't want to try to set up a two quarterback system. I don't. I hope someone just comes out, wins the job and everybody's on the same page. But I do think that this gives Rutgers a little bit more flexibility while they wait for Shepard and Sarace to continue to develop and potentially, you know, put their names in the hat as well. Uh, but again, it really comes down to how do defenses play you? And we won't really know that until the season starts. 
But if a guy clearly separates himself from the other ones under similar circumstances, then he's definitely going to get the first and second and third crack at, you know, playing on Saturdays next season. Yeah, I totally agree. Just going back to one comment you made about like Gavin not having touch sometimes in terms of those short passes. I did think that Cal McManus struggled with that a little bit too. He he yeah. throws pretty hard and uh, there were definitely some balls where, you know, he could have, I think, had a little bit more touch on it than he did. But it's going to be interesting. I think, you know, it's people wanted, I think, a, a clear upgrade. I think that Cal McManus, again, I, I think his ceiling um, isn't as high as Gavin long term, but I do think – he, he could he could definitely come in and win the job and be an upgrade overall. Uh, but I think you're right. I think that there's definitely a possibility that they they platoon, you know, even, either by design or it just kind of works out that way. Flashbacks to Shana 1.0 where he would mix and match based on how the game was going. You know, I, th- I think that is a possibility. Um, I also think, you know, it, it, having a quarterback come in that Shiraka knows inside and out, um, you know, and then is able to look back on this year and what changed, you know, I think that that's going to help the, um, you know, the transition also, uh, it's not like you're taking a flyer on somebody that doesn't have experience at this level or, but not only that you have a power five starter that you've also worked with before. So I think it's in a, a you don't want to say ideal situation. You'd rather have a, a blue chip, you know, uh, proven power five transfer coming in. But I think for what they were able to do, they upgrade, I, and I said this in my last podcast, that they, they owed it to this the, the returning group, I think, to give them this option to upgrade the position. And we know the offense has to take a step forward. I think we made good points about the defense also needing to take a step forward. Uh, you know, it, it, to keep the stability going, nothing's given for next season. And even though the schedule might appear easier, I don't think it's an easy schedule. And I think while – Everyone wants more than six regular season wins next year. I don't think going six and six would be a failure because I think that a lot of things could go wrong too. And I don't think anything's a given. I I, I think it's, you know, this team definitely has the potential to do more. um, But I think that there's a lot that has to happen to also maintain the success they had this year. For sure. I mean, in terms of uh, Calic Manage, just wrapping my comments on that, I mean, I think if you want to say where did he have the edge, just on, you know, comfort and throwing those first and 10, get six yards, get cheap, easy yards. I felt like Rutgers was always – it was always a struggle to get yards until late in games when the defense was worn out and then Manungai was just, like, pounding the rock. Other than yeah. that, it was always a struggle. Uh, and then the other way that I think that Calic Manis – what he brings to the table, he's definitely better at throwing deep sideline routes, which for, which does challenge the defense vertically and horizontally. I mean, yeah. I, I always felt like – I never thought Ben Roethlisberger was, like, the best quarterback in the NFL, but the team he played for always were able to have more available to them because he could throw those routes. He could throw deep crossers, and he could throw deep down the sideline. So the defense yeah. just had to respect it, even if, you know, again, I, I, I would I, – Personally, I think Eli Manning probably had a better career, was a better like quarterback overall. But just the fact that Roethlisberger had that allowed the team to do so much. So, I mean, on offense, that's kind of how I see it. But on defense, I agree with you. It's entirely possible this defense will not be as good as it was last year, especially if Motore is forced to play with more linebacker or you have an injury to Aaron Lewis or something like that, uh, or Robert Longerbeam, something like that. Uh, so I, I don't think that – going six and six next year would be a failure. I, I also want to clarify one of the comments I made in the, in a previous podcast, when I said you need to go to a bowl game every year, what I meant by that was if you don't go to a bowl game in a three year period, you got a clean house, whether it be, even if the head coach stays, but they hire all new coordinators and things like that. That's what you see at some of these other programs, but really you want to go every year. The expectation is that you should go at least two out of every three, if not three out of three. Right. Um, Next year, though, I mean, this program is pretty stable, but there are there are some areas where they don't have depth. And if something happens in those spots, it's entirely possible that the overall record regresses, even if the program is in the same state of stability that we've been talking about. And that's pretty much the theme of the whole entire bowl season. And this is what I put in my uh, off tackle empire, you know, season postmortem, basically that's going to be coming out soon is that Rutgers is a stable program right now. And you saw how that allowed them to 
beat a team like Miami that has a lot of talent but is in constant flux. And I feel like, yes, you do need to win games every year, but more importantly is just do you have a solid foundation in your program? And they definitely, Rutgers definitely does. So hopefully they can figure out a way to ensure they at least get to a bowl game again next year. But if they go five and seven, but beat someone good, or, you know, maybe they lose two games because, uh, you know, a quarterback or a corner or something fluky happens, like that's understandable in the place that this program is in right now. So yeah. Do I think they'll go to a bowl game next year? Yeah, I do. But could I see a scenario where it doesn't happen? Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily a sign that the program's trending down. It more right. just might be a sign that, you know, you didn't win all of your 50-50 games like you did this year. Well, I think that's the flip side of everybody coming back on defense, right, is you also have to develop depth behind them. And it's a lot harder to do that when you have, you know, you really don't have any openings uh, in the starting lineup. I think obviously the spring is going to be crucial for bringing a lot of the younger talent along. Um, but also, you know, having guys that they can uh, get, you know, and I think the first two games next year, you know, are actually well-timed because hopefully, you know, they can take care of business against Akron pretty easily. Then you have Howard, you know, you're getting younger guys, uh, not necessarily on the two deep or even just in at that second level, you know, more time early in the season. So if you do have some injury issues, you guys, you have guys that maybe have a little bit of, of snaps under their belt for the season. Um, because I do think that is a concern that they're they're very top heavy in terms of you know right. a, a very good starting lineup, but not a lot you know in terms of proven behind them, mm-hmm. and um, that's going to be key. I think that the Teray point is excellent. You know, can Moses Walker be a guy that steps up? Um, you know, in terms of that linebacker role alongside of Powell, assuming he can you know make a a, a pretty smooth recovery in terms of coming back and being ready. So yeah, th- there's more question marks than people necessarily want to take into account. But I do think, yes, this team could move forward. They could win seven regular season games, maybe get to eight, you know, depending on if everything goes right. But I think that the Cali Commandus move certainly provides more stability uh, to a program that needed it at that position. Um, you know, he's not he's not a guarantee, but uh, certainly I think improves the situation versus what they were at the end of this season. So it's going to be interesting to see how all the development goes this offseason. Any last closing thoughts here? Uh, we'll have plenty of time to discuss other things, you know, as as the soft season goes on. But um, anything you wanted to close with? Yeah, I mean, we didn't really talk about just the transfer portal defections. I, I would say my my main comment on there is that it's gone as well as you could have expected, which is that your starters are all here. They are pretty much everybody is coming back. You lost a couple guys from the two deep. Or in some positions, a third guy like we like an Aaron Young. He's not the backup running back, but obviously he's in the mix, right? So I think that as it went as well as it could have, and I think that's a sign of Rutgers being a relatively stable program. You can understand pretty much everybody who went in the portal, pretty much, right? If you're uh, and I mentioned the defensive line uh, already, which is there's a lot of guys like a Cameron Stewart, I believe, entered the the transfer portal, and that's a guy who would be playing on other teams, even in the big 10, but there's such a log jam at his position that, you know, you kind of have to size up. All right. With all the guys that are, you know, borderline too deep, am I going to be one of those ones that plays or not? And, or is it better for me to get an opportunity going elsewhere? And it seems like they still have enough depth at defensive end that I feel okay about it. But again, you're an injury or two away from having a too deep with not a lot of proven depth that's in there. So, you know, at linebacker, I felt like Moses Walker and Abram Wright both played pretty well in the bowl game, despite not really playing at all, all year. Yeah. And so you're probably in a good spot there. But again, I think every team has had more turnover pretty much in the transfer portal than Rutgers through this segment. But it's entirely possible that there will be more defections after the spring uh, during the next, you know, period transfer portal window. But we can't. You got to cross that bridge when you come to it and hope we don't come to that one. We hope that everyone, you know, is happy, continues to stay. But so far, so good. And, you know, that's a sign of players have belief in the coaching staff and what they're doing at Rutgers. And hopefully that, you know, is a sign that things continue to trend up, even if it's, you know, a similar season in terms of wins and losses next year. 
Yeah, great point. And I think that also shows that there is a real buy-in in the program that, you know, a lot of their younger talent, they're, they're not being impatient. They're not just leaving to go to find, you know, uh, playing time elsewhere. You know, they're bought into the fact that, okay, this is going to be a veteran team next year. Might not have a, a ton of opportunities next year, but if you continue to develop underneath them, really 20 to 25, I mean, it's wide open in terms of so many different position battles. So uh, I think that's a good sign as well. And something you have to, for Rutgers, you have to be able to do because you can't keep restocking, you know, and, 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 and uh, Shiano's talked about the pipeline and filling the pipeline in this 24 class fills that pipeline now, but now you got to keep the key parts of those pipeline and develop them. Um, And I think getting those guys to stay that that's, I think speaks to the culture big time as well. So, Overall, I think, you know, overall, uh, we're both optimistic, but, you know, at the same time, I think, you know, you can't uh, be delusional in the fact that um, a lot of progress still needs to be made this offseason. It's critical for the program to be able to take that step because you can't be complacent and um, you can't just assume, you know, six and six is an automatic every year now uh, to your point about, you know, going to a bowl game every year, every two out of three years, whatnot. Of course, the expectation is always to go, but that doesn't mean it's always going to happen. And just because you cross that one threshold doesn't mean it can't, you know, fall below it in, in the next season. So more to come in our discussions this off season. Really appreciate all your great insight once again. And thanks to everybody for listening to this uh, episode of the Scarlet Faithful podcast once again. <laughs>